Well, I want to welcome you to our session on angels. And uh, as, if you're just joining us, <coughs> we had a part one, which had a session on the angelic realm in general, in which we emphasized setting aside the baggage of our misconceptions as an essential prelude to the whole program. And then the second session, we got into biblical angels, their characteristics, their limitations, and so forth. Those were our two sessions constituting a part one. But we're now going to go into part two. But before we do, a little bit of review of one essential prerequisite may be in order. We spent some time in the first session on establishing what we call the boundaries of our reality. And we used Vitupian man as our reach of man. And that which was larger than us, we call the macrocosm. And that which was smaller than us, we call the microcosm. And examining the advances in science in both areas, we discovered something shocking. The macrocosm, our universe is finite. It's not infinite. And uh, it had a beginning. And uh, that's a prof that becomes a profound issue in our understanding our universe. As we go the other way into the microcosm, it's even more shocking as we discover that our entire uh, physical universe is made up of indivisible units. It's digital. And uh, we got into the Planck limits and so forth last time. But the main idea to realize is that which we consider the reality is actually bounded in largeness and smallness digitally. And so if we discover that we are actually in a virtual environment, a digital environment. In fact, um, we call the exterior of all of this the metacosm, that which is outside the boundaries of our physical universe. In fact, we uh, called attention to an article in Scientific American back in 2005, which discussed the fact that our constants of physics are changing. Therefore, that implies that our physical reality is actually a shadow of a larger reality. And that caught our attention because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. And most of what we're going to be dealing with, especially in the next few sessions, will be those things that are going on in the metacosm outside the normal physical boundaries of what we regard as our physical universe. And so I want to start by looking at a passage in the scripture that is extremely provocative strategically. It's, we, find that in, <coughs> we find it in Daniel chapter 10. And uh, we won't try to uh, exposit the whole thing. But Daniel chapter 10 involves a visit of an angel in preparation of two big chapters forthcoming, but the preparation is very provocative. This is a glimpse into what I call the dark side of the Metacosm. Down in chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name is called Belshazzar, the thing which was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was in mourning three full weeks. That's going to be an important period of time. Three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Hittichel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was like the, the barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and feet like the color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now many of these identifiers would tend to suggest that this may have been an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. There are many scholars that feel that it's not so, and I'll show you why. But clearly it's a very, very prominent angelic visitation. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. My comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which, t which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, 
and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So he apparently started at the time that Daniel started his fast. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. I should emphasize right now, this is not the guy that's sitting on the throne of Persia. This is the power behind that king. The prince of the kingdom of Persia is some kind of uh, angelic being, a hostile one that this guy is fighting with to get through. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. So this is an adversary. And he needed help, apparently, because Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. That's one of the reasons that some scholars don't believe this is an Old Testament appearance of Christ. He wouldn't have needed Michael's help. But apparently it is a very senior guy. It could be Gabriel. It doesn't say so. We don't know. But Michael is the military leader of the gang. He's a chief prince in many passages. Uh, he's the voice of the archangel that Paul alludes to in 1 Thessalonians 4 at the Harpazzo. And he's also, uh, un he fought with Satan himself in Jude 9. So he's a recurring figure here as we looked at last time. Continuing Daniel 10. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. And behold, one like the multitude of the sons of men touched my lips. And then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. For how can a servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengtheneth me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Be, peace be unto thee, and be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And he said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. There is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And this whole thing is just a prelude to the climactic chapters of 11 and 12 of Daniel. But the reason I get at this uh, opening thing, it gives us an insight behind the scenes here in what I call the dark side. We discover that spiritual conflicts occur among spiritual beings behind the emergence of the major empires. The Persian Empire was arise, and this guy had to fight through that, whatever the, the spiritual behind that, to get through. And uh, he's also going, he announces he's going to have to fight Greece also. Well, Greece is two centuries later from the Persian Empire. So there's a whole different time dimension to all these things. The other thing we learned then, it's very strange, but that these spiritual beings are territorial in some sense at least. And they have locality. And uh, they impact and are imp impacted by our own actions. There's a connection of some kind between what we do in our physical universe. Here's Daniel fasting and praying, and that apparently empowered him to get through with his message to Daniel. And uh, that gives us pause as we begin to understand that there's a war going on in the metacosm. And uh, so, so we... Uh, now are entering in this session part two, the invisible warfare side of our four session review of angels. And we're in session three, what I call the dark side. We're going to talk again about misconceptions that get in our way of understanding. And then we're going to talk about Satan, um, his origin, his agenda, and his destiny. And there's a lot of misconceptions about this guy. We're going to talk about hybrids. Where did they come from and what's their agenda here? And uh, in the next session, we'll go on and we'll talk some practical applications of all of this stuff. I'll add an addendum of session one we'll put in there about the, the metacosm. There's another insight that I'll add to the ones we've already drawn about a holographic universe. But then we'll continue the agenda here. We'll talk about demons. How do they differ from fallen angels? What's their agenda? What are their limitations? We'll talk about an era that is coming upon us that people are calling the age of the hybrids. Why are they calling it? What's that all about? And then we'll finalize the whole series of four sessions with what I call spiritual hygiene and uh, the armor of God. What are our resources as we discover that we are both the pawns and the prizes in this warfare that's going on? So 
we're now going to get into session three in substance. You know, we see all kinds of caricatures about Satan. Most of them are quite frivolous and just tongue-in-cheek kind of things, and yet there's also, in addition to those problems, uh, an, a, a huge body of English literature. And Dante Alighieri is uh, one of these authors. He wrote a thing called The Divine Comedy in Italian. Uh, it is an epic poem written in the uh, 14th century. And uh, uh, widely con uh, considered the preeminent work of Italian literature, one of the greatest works in world literature. It is a very imaginative poem and includes an allegorical vision of the afterlife, but it's really a culmination of actually misunderstandings from the medieval church, the medieval worldview in the Western church. And so on the surface, the poem describes Dante's travels through the medieval concepts of hell, purgatory, and heaven. And allegorically, it would represent a soul's journey towards God. And of course, he draws upon Christian theology as they understood it, but much of that, unfortunately, was an error, and that confuses the situation for us. Then we get to this character called Faust. Uh, he's a protagonist of a classic German legend, highly successful scholar, but also dissatis dissatisfied with his life. He makes a deal with the devil, exchanging his soul for an unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. Faust's tale is the basis for many literary, artistic, cinematic, and musical works. And uh, we find uh, that uh, even Faust and his name used as an adjective describe an arrangement where an ambitious person surrenders moral integrity in making a deal with the devil. And so, and uh, there are plays and puppet theater that followed from Faust. Uh, the, the story was, uh, the, the German thing was in the 16th century. It was later popularized in England by Christopher Marlowe, who made it, uh, created a play called The Tragic History of Dr. Faustus. And then further, Goethe comes up two centuries later, and uh, he becomes, a, again, a dissatisfied intellectual that yearns for more and does his deal with Satan. So these ideas pervade our literature in many forms, but they tend to form a presumption that about Satan that's incorrect and unbiblical. Where this all really starts, from our point of view, is back in Genesis 3, where God declares war on Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this starts a warfare between two seeds, the seed of the woman, which is a title of the Messiah, namely Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent, Many people don't realize that just as there was a Messiah on the good side, there is an evil one called the seed of the serpent that's the adversary. And uh, there, th these are the forces that lie behind the entire biblical scenario from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. You can study the Bible end to end as a, an appar a, a stratagem by Satan to thwart the plan of God and he, all the things he tries to do and so forth. And so... This, these same forces are behind the world powers today, and we need to understand that. And so, all this is going to lead to a climax where there will be a coming world leader, that is Satan's man. He won't appear that way, very attractive, but he'll be welcomed, and he'll have a false prophet, and that is all part of eschatology. We won't try to get into all that here in this brief review. But we are in a period of time that is called the Times of the Gentiles. And that's a sequence of empires that started with Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and finishes with the Antichrist at the very end. This is a, a, an era of Gentile dominion. But one of the things as we go along here, it's worth taking a close look at, and that's the darkness of Nazi Germany. We're all familiar with the rise of Hitler and the Holocaust and all of that. There's some very s profound lessons lying behind that, what I call the lessons of Auschwitz. If you visit Israel, one of the things you do want to do, we never visit Israel without visiting the memorial to the Holocaust called Yad Vashem. And uh, it's a phenomenal place to visit, very illuminating. But one of the things that emerges as you examine carefully the rise of Hitler and his fall, as the Allies drew closer to the fall of Berlin, the Nazi leadership, you would think, would draw their best generals, their best resources, back to defend headquarters. No, they did something very strange. The Nazi leadership increased the priorities of exterminating Jews in all the camps rather than withdraw resources for the protection of their own headquarters. The revealing thing here as you study the orders in those days is that the priority of exterminating Jews enjoyed a higher priority than their own survival. What does that tell you? 
that tells you that that was demonic. Clearly, the, the powers there were beyond uh, rational uh, analysis. So moving on, um, we have, of course, the rise and the fall of America. That's a whole topic of its own. And there's some evidence that there may be the abandonment of their heritage. It will lead to uh, the abandonment and wrath of God. And that may have already started. And that's a study in its own right. We certainly also have scholars beginning to recognize the possibility of the rise of an Islamic Antichrist. So it clearly uh, what's unfolding on our horizon will impose on us a urgent knowledge to really understand what the Bible has been saying all along. But let's, we're going to focus here on the misconceptions of Satan. All the rest is tangential to this thing as far as we're concerned this morning. We need to guard against the fables and the distortions prevalent throughout all the world's literature. And uh, Satan does not rule in hell. It's a common misconception. No, hell was made for him. It was created for him as his place of incarceration, ultimately. And uh, this also leads to another bundle of misconceptions that we all share in about hell itself. We use that term so loosely without any real recogni recognition of what the word means. Uh, there, it, it's in Greek, it's Hades. In Hebrew, it's Sheol. And uh, there are other words that are closely related to it that we need to understand if we're going to be precise. And uh, one of the things we really learn about Bible studies, it pays off to really be precise, be careful. And uh, the idea of hell, of course, has its misconceptions in literature and in art that is uh, a, a quite a distance from the biblical perspective. The word hell it was derived from an English word, a Saxon word, helan, which means to cover. It's the covered or the invisible place. And uh, in scripture, there are four words that have been translated in English as hell. And one is Sheol. Uh, that's the Hebrew word in the Old Testament. Uh, Hades is the Greek equivalent term. Gehenna and Tartarus are also translated hell, but are quite different uh, conceptions than Hades, frankly. So Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus is Greek. Sheol is in the Hebrew. And uh, the Sheol occurs 65 times in the Old Testament, derived from a root word meaning to ask or demand. In other words, the word really implies ins insatiableness. Proverbs 30 really focuses on that. It's rendered grave 31 times. If that's technically not a quite an accurate uh, translation. I'll show you why in a minute. And uh, it's grave in a collective sense. Grave and Sheol are quite different. A uh, Sheol is rendered hell 31 times. It's the place of disembodied spirits is really the intention here. And uh, so the inhabitants of Sheol are the congregation of the dead, according to Proverbs 21. It's the abode of the souls of the wicked dead, specifically in a number of places. It's also, though, the domain of, good, of the good that have passed. We see that in the Psalms, many places. So Sheol is, is described as deep, dark, and with bars all through Job. And uh, the dead go down to it. So e at least linguistically, it's, it's, a, it's a downward conception, a geocentric conception. But Sheol is not to be confused with a grave. There's a different word in the Hebrew. And sometimes the word Sheol is used connotatively. But the grave is a physical place for the bodies, not the, not the disembodied spirits. You can own a grave. You can use graves in the plural. There can be many graves. There's Sheol is never in the plural. It's always in the singular. And uh, a grave is physical, receives the bodies. And uh, it can be used in the plural. One can have title. To, you can own actually several graves and so on. Sheol is singular, never used in the plural. It's, it's a different conception. And uh, so now the Greek equivalent term is Hades. And it's the word for that which is out of sight to denote the place of the dead. And uh, it's translated hell 11 times in the New Testament. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses Hades to translate the term Sheol uh, into, into the Greek. And that's used on 61 occasions. So they're equivalent terms for our purposes. In Greek, it's uh, associated with Orcus. In the Greek conception of Hades, it had two subterranean divisions, Elysium and Tartarus. And that turns out to parallel the perception we draw from Luke 16, we'll come, we'll come to in a minute. Elysium is the good place, the paradise equivalent sort of. Tartarus is the dark, bad place, if you will. We'll come back to that later. Uh, so Hades it, uh, really refers to the abode of the unsaved dead prior to the great white throne judgment, for sure. That's what Revelation 20 talks about. It's a prison. It has gates, bars, and locks, according to Matthew 16 and other passages. It is a downward concept in some sense. 
the righteous and the wicked are separated in Hades, apparently. And uh, so some view the blessed dead as part of Hades that's called paradise. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And it's also alluded to as Abraham's bosom in Luke 16. And we'll look at that in detail here in a minute. And uh, the rich man and Lazarus in, in uh, Luke uh, 16 are a place where we learn most of these conceptions that the Lord Jesus taught us. And uh, the rich man lifted up his eyes and could see sense. He could see the bosom of Abram afar off. So strangely, he's in the dark place, the bad place, but he's aware. He has consciousness. He's aware. And he knows that the... the uh, that Lazarus is in the good place. So he somehow is conscious of all of that. And uh, so Abraham's bosom was, is regarded in heaven in Matthew. So that term is used two ways. And I'll show, try to resolve that ambiguity in a minute. And so most of the early church fathers regarded uh, paradise as a part of heaven, not Hades. And uh, the two compartment view that we're talking about is somewhat an accommodation to the Greek conception, but it is the one that under, undergirds Luke 16 that the Lord's teaching us from. There's another term that comes up, and that's Gehenna. And that's quite different. It originally was Gehenna Hinnom, which is the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. What it originally was, was a physical, uh, a city dump. Uh, uh, it was a, a deep, narrow ravine on the south of Jerusalem uh, and uh, uh, separating Mount Zion from the Hill of Evil Council. And uh, here the idolatrous Jews offered their children in sacrifice to Molech in a very dark era of their own back then. And so Gehenna is the valley that afterwards became the city dump. The fire was continually burning there, so it becomes idiomatically the ultimate lake that burns with fire and brimstone uh, and, the, and the everlasting uh, uh, condemnation. And it's used in that sense 11 times by the Lord Jesus himself as an idiom for what really is hell in the ultimate sense. Now, uh, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now, I want to distinguish Hades and Gehenna. They're different. Both are translated hell in the English, but that causes the confusion. Hades is temporary. Everything that's in Hades will ultimately end up being thrown into Gehenna at the end in Revelation 20. And uh, Gehenna is forever. It has no end. It's outside the time dimension. And uh, Hades is in the earth. It, se it appears to be geocentric, at least in concept, if not actually. It also seems to be associated with the bottomless pit, the abuso or the abyss. And uh, there is a term that we run into, the outer darkness, that is misunderstood by most uh, scholars that haven't done their homework. I'm among them. We all have made the same mistake. We all assume that the outer darkness was an allusion to Gehenna. We discover by examining the Greek and some other uh, aspects that that's doubtful, that it's simply a, a, wisp, a misunderstood phrase having to do with the being separated from the Shekinah. And that's a special study in its own right. I just want to alert you to the fact that the outer darkness thing is a controversy of its own, that uh, uh, the, exegetic, the expert exegetes will point out that that doesn't translate properly the way we think of it. So, but anyway, okay, we'll keep moving here. Tartarus is another word translated hell. It only has one use in the New Testament, and that's by Peter. And uh, it shows up in Homer's Iliad. Uh, Tartarus is the deepest abyss of Hades, is the way it's described. It's as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. <laughs> so, so I don't know what that all means, except I don't want to go there. Okay, so Tartarus. It's the specific place of incarceration of angels that sinned. We're going to talk about the angels that sinned, fallen angels that sinned that have a special place of incarceration. Tartarus is the label for that. They get released in a very strange way in Revelation 9, apparently. The other term we want to deal with is the abuso. And uh, it's a, another term that relates to what we call the bottomless pit, or the abyss. The Greek is it's, uh, abusos in the Greek. And this is where the beast of Revelation 11 and 17 emerge out of. And... Uh, it's, it's also where Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. And so that is, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, a, a temporary holding place to hold Satan during the millennium. It, and he'll be released at the end of it. It's also the place, apparently, from which the demon locusts emerge in Revelation 9. So it shows up in our Bible several key places. So that we're dealing here with what collectively might be called the underworld. 
and Hades is the collective Greek term for it. There, it has two compartments, a place of torment and a paradise that's sometimes called Abraham's bosom. But that two compartment concept is the Greek concept, but it's also the one the Lord uh, uh, portrays when we look at Luke 16. Most of what we know about the underworld derives from the details in Luke 16. And we also encounter uh, an impassable gulf between those two compartments that you can't pass from one to the other, the Lord tells us. And there's also an allusion made to the abuso, the bottomless pit, and most of us presume that that may be somehow linked to the impassable gulf, but that's a presumption on our part. And so Tartarus is also probably another Greek term uh, for the abuso, if you will. But in any case, the rich man and Lazarus, a very key chapter for you to study on your own. The man in Hades, though, the rich man who go, dies and goes to Hades, is fully conscious. We recognize that from the... Di By the way, that's not a parable. That's an actual event. In parable, people don't have names. And here we have a specific name in Lazarus. No, Jesus is describing some specifics. And uh, the man in Hades had a memory. He was able to speak. He was in deep pain. And he had uh, intense desires. Uh, his eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. He understood that. He never questioned it. He never felt it was unjust, strangely enough. In fact, he knew just what he was experiencing was fair and just. And he alludes to that. He also knew what his brothers needed to do uh, to, do to av avoid his own um, fate, to repent. He pleads for someone to get that message to his brothers so that they wouldn't uh, inherit the the uh, fate that he is suffering. And he was not yet in hell, by the way. He was in Hades. Gehenna is yet future on his situation. In fact, that guy asking for uh, a touch of water is still waiting today for that. And uh, so now the question is, okay, when Jesus goes to the cross, spends three days in the grave, he goes down there to declare his victory. And we understand that he then gathered those that were in Abraham's bosom to be with him from that point on. So he emptied out uh, that section of Hades is the uh, widespread uh, theological, and primarily from 1 Peter 3.19 and some other passages. And so, misconceptions of Satan. He does not rule in hell. Hell was created for him. And there are two prevalent myths about Satan we want to be conscious of. The first one is that he doesn't really exist that it's just a collective term for evil or something. No, he's a person, he has personality, he had an origin, and he has a destiny. And uh, anyone that doesn't believe that he exists should try resisting him for a while. And that will become very, very clear to you personally. The second thing to realize, he has locality. He's not everywhere, he's not omnipresent, but his resources are obviously enormous and it's very substantial. And so, there are two passages that we have to really review to understand where we get the biblical notions of what Satan is really all about. Ezekiel 28 is one of those. It's a very, both of them are strange passages in that they puncture a local reference to go get behind what's really going on. The power behind the throne might be the subtitle here. And uh, when in Ezekiel 28, starting at verse 1, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So Tyrus is a king that's on an ego trip, and it's used as the occasion to make some other comments here. And the prince of Tyrus is actually the guy on the throne. And, uh, but thou art a man, okay. He claims that he's a God. And that's what Isaiah uses for the king of Babylon in the next, in the next thing we'll look at. There are other examples of this, the boast of Pharaoh in, uh, in uh, Ezekiel 29, the praise given to Herod Agrippa by the tyrants in Acts 12. Many times you find a, a tyrant on an ego trip really believing that he somehow is a god. And Paul's description of the Antichrist, the man of sin, uh, is w w with nearly the same words in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, who opposes and exalt himself above all that is called God. That's the Antichrist we're talking about. And that is worship. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the final uh, 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 peak of, uh, um, of uh, uh, 
ego that the Antichrist will achieve in 2 Thessalonians 2. And I sit in the seat of God. Tyre was known as a holy island, by the way. The thought was uh, as, as if it rose its, you know, from the rock throne of God. That was a, the concept of the time. Though thou set thy heart. See, the words remind us of the temptation that, that was given by Satan in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, verse 5. But let's continue here. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and thine understanding thou hast gotten these riches, and thou hast gotten gold and silver with thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thy heart lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So that's the prediction God is giving the ego tri- uh, the, the, this guy that uh, is on the ego trip here. And the guy's name by secular history is Ethbel III. He was removed from his throne by Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th uh, century. So the power behind the throne. Now you're going to, the language starts to shift strangely as God continues this theme here. The prince of Tyre is the first 11 verses. That's an actual king of Tyre that is being dealt with here. And uh, the word is ruler there, the man at the top and so forth. Now, this ruler was, as I say, Ethbel III. The king of Tyre is a term that's going to show up here in the next group of verses that uh, are, it, it, it's a different term, a term that Ezekiel doesn't use of earthly kings, strangely enough. And uh, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king, the Melech of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. What we're going to sense here is there's a shift in scope. The text here is going to go far beyond the person that w- sitting on the throne. It's going to be focusing on the power that's behind the guy on the throne, as you'll see the language unfold here. The king is, again, a term that uh, 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 is unique here. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Now, these are pr- superlatives that apply to this king. And uh, so... So even though it's applied to the king of Tyre, and once it's, it's similar language that Isaiah is going to use in Isaiah 14 on Satan himself, as you'll see. The king, well, actually the king of Babylon. But there's an ulterior or an, a, an accomplishment in Satan um, and his embodiment in the Antichrist is going to surface here. So let's take a look at it. God continues, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. That's certainly not the case of the king sitting on the, uh, on, on the throne of Tyre. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. Thy workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So this is a created being here. These precious stones are an an ancient way of describing different colors of light. And we find their use in many places in the Bible in, in, in a very similar way. And uh, that was in the Garden of God. That, uh, Eden was on the earth. And uh, this is obviously a change of scope then. On these precious stones, they are the same stones that we find in the breastplate of the high priest. And uh, the first and the twelfth, the, the first and the last of these are the sardius, which sp- speaks of Reuben, behold a son. The last one, Jasper, the son of my right hand. We discover there's all kinds of uh, implications of those stones in the breastplate of the high priest. And uh, nine of them are mentioned here of the 12. And uh, uh, we don't have to get into it. The reason these show up so significantly to anybody that's doing a serious study of the Bible is we see them show up again as descriptions of the New Jerusalem, the strange um, hyperspace that shows up at the end of uh, Revelation, Revelation 21. The building of the wall was of jasper. The city was of pure gold like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all member of, um, manner of... Uh, Precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, and uh, the fifth sardonyx, then the sardius, then the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, and the uh, eleventh jacinth, 
and the twelfth an amethyst. One of the difficulties in analyzing these things is the labels of those stones change through ancient years. So there, it, it's hard to correlate the New Testament allusions here with the Torah allusions earlier and so forth. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls and every gate was one pearl and the street was pure gold as it were transparent glass. So that's the, we're dealing in a hyperspace. We talked about that in the first session. But the other thing it mentions here about the tabrets and thy pipes which are musical, musical terms. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the tabrets and pipes are, uh, that's why some scholars suspect that Lucifer's job before he fell was to head up worship because his musical skills apparently were unexcelled. And uh, tabrets are tambourines and pipes are the holes in the musical pipes and so forth. Those are the terms in the Hebrew there. But he continues now, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Strange term. Uh, that term is, uh, implies that he was a cherub, a super angel that we talked about previously. He was the anointed one that covereth. He was the one in charge of the whole program. He says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And uh, again, the super angels we talked about in the previous sessions. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, in the saddest word of all, until the iniquity was found in thee. So he was a created being, as all the angels were. They were created before the earth was, and so forth, because they cheer when the earth is formed. And uh, yet, Christ was the one that created him, and God used the Logos to create all things we discover from many passages, um, and including Satan was a created being. So with all his power, he's still just a created being until iniquity was found in E. It, it, iniquity fell because of pride. We're going to see that in the Isaiah passage, and that's why God hates pride. And so, so Ezekiel's describing this king in terms that could not be applied to mere man. This king appeared in the Garden of Eden, verse 13. He had been a guardian cherub in verse 14, and he had possessed a free access to God's holy mountain, and he was sinless from the time he was created, at least for a while. And so that's where sin began in his heart. And he says, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Therefore I will cast thee as profane. So this is where Satan is cast out. And there's a lot of scholastic debate as to exactly when that happened. All we know is that it had already happened by the time you get to Genesis 3. And we'll move on for, on that. He was driven out of the place of sanctity where he had once occupied. And he's the covering cherub, the guy in charge. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom and by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And because all through pride, all through pride. And thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. That's his destiny. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. So that's that passage. Isaiah 14 gives us a similar glimpse into the origin of Satan. And this is a lamentation on the king of Babylon, but it really goes far beyond the literal king of Babylon. So, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken, which did weaken the nations? So, fallen from heaven, this is Lucifer, that was his original label. And we have the famous five I wills here. God says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne upon the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The I will, the I will, the I will, the five I wills here. And uh, now, yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to the sides of the pit. And uh, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? And uh, 
that made the world as a wilderness, that destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. Now, when did that all happen? There are some people that believe that it happened between the first two verses of chapter 1 of Genesis. But that, again, is a whole other study that we explore in another area. But uh, when did that happen? We don't know. But there is uh, some strange allusions that, may, that reference that in Jeremiah 4 and Ezekiel 31. But let's just go on here. All the kings of nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them, his burden depart from off their shoulders. Very strange allusion here to the Assyrian. We discover the first world dictator, Nimrod, was an Assyrian. In effect, we know that the pharaoh of Egypt during the Exodus was not Egyptian. He was an Assyrian, according to Isaiah 50. And that term is also used of the Antichrist, strangely enough. So we find it showing up very interestingly in a number of key places. I'll leave that for further study and we'll go on here. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, that this hand that is stretched upon all the nations the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? His hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? And uh, so this is his God's purpose. So here we have Satan. We've talked about his origin in these two key passages, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. We're going to see his agenda summarized for us in the 12th chapter of Revelation. And we're going to find his destiny is unequivocally detailed in the last, couple, the last few chapters of the book of Revelation. And so, now, we have a study of the kingdom, power, and glory that starts with a study, a side study, of the origin of evil, where we go into some of these things and the idea of, a, of the uh, fall of Satan occurring in the fir- before sometime uh, prior to the second verse of, of the book of Genesis. But we also go into thy kingdom come. What does that really mean? Most people don't understand. That we really try to nail down the eternal security issue and the uh, uh, inheritance and rewards, which makes this, of course, a very controversial study and the whole counsel of God being your remedy to avoid heresy. So those studies I uh, commend to you to, if you want to get further into some of these issues. But uh, Satan is an actual person. He's not some kind of force or personification of evil. We need to understand that. He has intelligence. He has emotion. He has volition. He makes choices. Uh, He is a morally responsible being, apparently. And uh, he was created. He was originally very good. He was created by Christ and for him. And uh, so, yet sometime after his creation, before Genesis 3, he rebelled against God and lost his holy condition uh, through conceit. There's little doubt that he's a fallen angel, obviously. After his fall, he led both angels and human beings into spiritual death by his murderous, untruthful schemes. That's all documented in in both the Old and New Testament. We discover from Revelation 12 that one-third of the angels apparently rebelled with him and are part of his cadre. And so uh, Satan also has many titles. He's spoken of as the prince of this world. That's a strange title. Think about it. He is, he's the God of this age, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is the evil one. He is the enemy. He is the a murderer, liar, and a father of lies, according to Jesus' own words in John 8. He is called the tempter. He is an adversary like a roaring lion. That's what the word Satan really means, is our adversary. Uh, he is spoken of as the great dragon who deceives the whole world in Revelation 12. The great dragon is there identified. That symbol is identified for you by John. Uh, he's the ancient serpent in 2 Corinthians 11, Revelation 20 and elsewhere. He's, the angel, he's an angel of light. He's not ugly, by the way. All these artists' uh, attempts notwithstanding, he's extremely attractive. That's the problem. And uh, he's an, he can be an angel of light. He's referred to as Beelzebub and Belial as, as various titles. He has his own kingdom, we learn in Luke 11. And the whole world is under the control of the evil one, John emphasizes to us in several places. So we need to understand that. And uh, his powers are great, but he is not all-powerful. He is able to affect the processes of nature, uh, so as to cause even physical death. 
He's not omnipotent, however. He needs God's permission to do what he does. That's a very, very important thing to understand. Everything that happens to you is father filtered. And uh, so he's extremely wise, of course, but he's not omniscient. He travels rapidly around the world, but he's not omnipresent. He has great influence in the affairs of human government, yet his forces are not invincible. That's one of the things we learned from Daniel 10. And uh, there is a summary of him in Revelation chapter 12, where we have the imagery of the woman and the man-child. And we have the woman, who is identified with the sun, moon, and 12 stars, strangely, with a man-child. And we have a red dragon that's uh, uh, trying to attack her, uh, has seven heads, ten hordes, and seven crowns, to devour the man-child when born. He's identified in verse 9 of chapter 12 as none other than Satan, so we know who that one is. The man-child is clear, too, because he rules all the nations with a rod of iron, and that identity is used dozens of times throughout both the Old and New Testament of none other than the Messiah. And uh, he's caught up to God in his throne, which most of us visualize as the ascension. It may include something else I'll come back to. And uh, so the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. Michael and his angels fight the dragon and his angels. And uh, the dragon is cast to the earth. And uh, he, pers- uh, he persecutes the woman for three and a half years. The 1260 days, the three and a half years, the half of a seven year period, uh, the 42 months, all those designators are used in both the Old and the New Testament for the most documented period of time in the Bible, namely that time when she is persecuted, specifically what we, what we call, what the Lord labeled as the Great Tribulation. Well, now, who are these players? The woman is not the church. Some scholars are a little confused about that. She is identified by none other than Jacob when he interprets Joseph's dream, the sun, the moon, the 12 stars, are idioms of the nation Israel. And they're used, uh, so used. And also, the church is not the, if the, if the woman's the church, she's in trouble because she's pregnant. <laughs> she's going to have a man-child. That's not the church. No, it's Israel. Israel brought forth, that her purpose was to bring forth the man-child, the, the Messiah. And the red dragon, of course, is identified as the serpent, devil, and Satan. And the man-child, of course, is the kinsman redeemer, the, the Messiah himself. Which leads to an interesting, I think it was G.H. Pember that first uh, suggested the possibility when you talk about the man-child being caught up to God in his throne, it certainly includes the ascension, but idiomatically it may include the harpazo, the capture of, God, of the body of Christ. Well, that's only one person, yeah, but that's exactly what, the way it's used there. So that's a possibility, a very provocative one when you, because what follows all that is, of course, the Great Tribulation and the rest of it. So that's another whole, that's an eschatological study I encourage you to undertake yourself. So Satan's whereabouts. God expelled him from the Mount of God. We discovered in Ezekiel 28, he was cast from God's government in heaven, but is still allowed access to God, according to Job 1 and others. And uh, in the tribulation, Satan will be cast from heaven and restricted to the earth. And uh, during the millennium, he'll be confined to the bottomless pit. And uh, the... uh, the, uh, the two beasts of Revelation 13 will be cast into Gehenna. But Satan has a thousand years uh, incarceration before he gets released. He leads another rebellion, and then he is cast in the lake of fire forever. And so that's his destiny, all very explicit in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Now, the, his stratagems all along, he, way back, he tried to corrupt Adam's line by the generation of these hybrids. We're going to talk about those. Adam's seed... Uh, being uh, corrupted in, in Genesis 12 and so forth, that he goes after the famine in Genesis 50. The destruction of the male line when Moses and all, uh, was the, the one that was saved from the, the orders of Pharaoh to kill all the Jewish children. Pharaoh's pursuit dur- during the, uh, to try to wipe them out after the Exodus is, was again all, uh, all attempts by Satan to wipe out God's purpose here. When God tells in, in Genesis 15, tells uh, Abraham that his people will leave the land for 400 years and then come back. That gave Satan 400 years to lay down a minefield. And he populates them with the same thing he did in Genesis 6. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then when God, as God focuses his prophecies on what he's going to do, it allowed Satan to focus his attacks. When God announced it was going to be Abraham, Abraham was singled out. When God announced it was going to be through the line of David, David is singled out from 2 Samuel 7 and following. And uh, Joram kills all his brothers, but misses one. 
And the Arabians slew all but missed one, Ahaziah. And Athaliah tried to kill all of the descendants, but missed a servant hid one of the babies. And so he, all the way through, he, Satan's trying to wipe out the royal line. He never quite makes it. And all the way through, even in Esther, in the Persian Empire, Haman's attempt to wipe out all the Jews is a satanic plot. But God is always ahead of him there. And so in the New Testament, Joseph's fear when Mary was pregnant, was he was concerned for her. Herod's attempts to kill all the babes in Bethlehem is a well-known uh, issued around Christmas time. Um, when, at, when Jesus is at Nazareth trying to give a sermon, they try to throw him off a cliff. And there were two storms at sea, which I believe were not natural storms. There, there, there's an undercurrent behind those. But uh, Satan's trying, and then of course the ultimate attempt is where Satan attempts to wipe out, uh, wipe out at the cross. And uh, that whole summary, of course, is in Revelation 12, which we looked at it. But the main point is he's not through yet. He is still not through with his agenda because he believes if he wipes out the believing Jews, he can thwart the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has some lieutenants we need to be aware of. The locusts of Revelation 9 had a king over them, we learn, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, in the Greek Apollyon. Some people believe those are just uh, similar titles of Satan. They might be. I'm among those that believe they're just senior lieutenants of his for whatever reasons, but they're alluded there in Revelation 9. There are also the locusts of Amos 7. Many people miss this because the Masoretic text has a, an unfortunate translation. When you get into the Greek, the Septuagint, it's clear the locusts of Amos 7, verse 1, had a king over them and by the name of Gog. So when you get to Ezekiel 30, uh, 8 and 39, you're dealing with a demonic title that is do- defined for us back in Amos 7 in the Greek, for what it's worth. So, but let's get back to this advent of the hybrids. J- Satan had a very bizarre strategy that led to the flood of Noah. And Genesis chapter 6 is the key to it. It also echoes in Numbers 13 and again in Revelation 9. Let's take a look at this here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. I want you to notice something most commentators miss, that the first two verses are one sentence. So let's read it as one sentence. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Benaiah Elohim, the sons of God, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So the sons of God are picking up on the daughters of men here. Okay. The word sons of God is a key term here, Benaiah Elohim. In the Hebrew, it refers to a direct creation of God, which involves two things. Adam was a direct creation of God, and the angels were. And uh, we are sons of Adam, unless we've been born again. If we haven't been born again, we're sons of Adam. There's, Adam was a created, direct creation, the others were not. And uh, the daughters of men is a different term. That's Benoth Adam. They're daughters of Adam, not daughters of Seth, as some people are taught in seminary. That's a misconception to try to... to uh, uh, skirt what the, what, the, what the scriptures really say. And uh, so, sons of God, Benihah, they're angel. that's a term for angels. Obviously, Adam was a uh, direct creation, but the term is used then th- throughout the, ter- t- uh, the, uh, the uh, Old Testament as a term for angels. In Job chapter 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, 7, it's a term for, obviously, angels. Even in Luke, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 36, we find the same appellation used there. The book of Enoch, which is not part of the Bible, but it's a second century B.C. A compendium of rabbinical beliefs, and it's useful for vocabulary and for understanding what their views were. It's not a part of the Bible, but they also uh, recognize that term as used of angels. And the Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament into Greek, always uses the term angelos for translating that Hebrew term. And so it goes on in verse 4, but they were Nephilim in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So the, the strange um, output of this unholy combination are hybrids of some kind, called Nephilim, the Nephilim, key term. Now, in the Hebrew, it's Nephilim, uh, and it's also after that. I want, it's not just before the flood of Noah, but I want you to keep that in mind. The Nephilim. It's the fallen ones. It comes from a Hebrew word, nafal, which means to be cast down, to fall away, to desert. 
So Nephilim are the fallen ones, is what the term actually means. And the Hagibarim are the unnatural offspring here, the mighty ones. Now the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word gigantes. They happen to be giants, but that's not what the word means. The word gigantes means the earthborn. It comes from gigas, which means earthborn. And so, yes, they happen to be giants, but you miss that in the translation, that it's actually the earthborn or the fallen ones. Again, we're talking about these hybrids. When you get down to about the ninth verse of chapter 6, you learn something else about the genealogy of Noah. These are the generations of Noah, the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. The word perfect there is the word tamim in the Greek, excuse me, in the Hebrew, which it means without physical blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. In other words, uh, Noah's family were not corrupted by the mixture of these hybrids that Satan had introduced into the picture. And that may be one of the reasons he was picked. Now, a lot of people get concerned, can angels have sex? They're confused because in two places in the New Testament, Jesus tells us that angels in heaven, uh, the, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are in the but are as the angels of God in heaven. We're, ta- we're not talking about fallen angels here. We're talking about angels that are in heaven, unfallen. We do notice that angels, when they appear on the earth, are always male. Uh, it's interesting when you get to the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah. That whole episode in Genesis 19 makes no sense until you realize that they were uh, masculine angels. But anyway, there's another, there's another word that we want to understand that is in the New Testament uh, <coughs> twice. Okaterion in the Greek. It refers to the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. It's a technical term used only twice in the Bible. It's, the, it's from that which from which the angels that fell had disrobed. And that's in Jude 6. It's also used alluding to the heavenly body with, w- for which the believer longs to be clothed our resurrection body, if you will. Uh, In Jude 6, And the angels which kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. So Jude here is making an allusion to this. And he compares it with uh, even a Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So when you look at this passage here, the word habitation in the Greek is actually the word okaterion. It's that which they, they left. They left that estate. They disrobed themselves of the, 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 the estate they found themselves in. So they somehow were able to shuck that off in some way. In contrast to that, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, 2, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. And the word house there, strangely, is okaterian. So uh, we, I su- I'm beginning to suspect that has a technical term that uh, restricts its use in a very special way. But meanwhile, you and I will go on. The, the, it turns out the Nephilim were not limited to those strange goings on before the flood of Noah. Because when we get, uh, in Genesis verse 4, it, said it, it happens also after that. What's it referring to? Well, there were four tribes we find in Genesis 14, 15. The Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and the Zamzumim, which apparently uh, were bad news because uh, Joshua was told to wipe out a man, woman, child of those four tribes. That's pretty strange stuff. When you get to them encounter in Canaan, Numbers 13, 33, we discover that in the land of Canaan were Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim. They were also giants. They were Nephilim. In fact, the spies call them that. There are Nephilim in the land, they announce in Numbers 13, 33. And we have Og, the king of Bashan, who's the king of the giants in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12 and so forth. And Goliath and his four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the thing. He was ready for all, the, all the five of them. We all know the story of Goliath. He was a son of Anak. He was a, an offspring of these strange creatures. So anyway, we have uh, looked at the... Uh, dark side here, rather superficially perhaps. We talked about the rampant misconceptions that we're facing. Uh, we talked about Satan, his origin, his agenda, and destiny. 
And we've had a touch on the hybrids, their origin and role. Uh, we're not through with them. We're going to discover they have a modern counterpart, apparently. We'll talk about it in the next session. But as we get to the next session, I want to it will have a prelude of a metacosmic addendum. There's something about the metacosm. I didn't feel it was a, a, we had time to uh, add in our first session, but it's like a footnote or a supplemental addendum uh, on the existence of our reality that I think you'll find rather provocative. But that's sort of just an addendum, a supplemental note. We're going to go right on into the demons and their agenda and limitations. They're very distinct from angels. We'll talk about how they're different. Uh, we'll also talk about the age of hybrids that's being coming that's coming upon us, and that's going to have some aspects that may surprise you. And finally, of course, we'll talk about okay, given what we have summarized in these sessions, what does that imply for us personally in terms of our spiritual hygiene, and what are our resources, namely the armor of God. And so that'll be next time.